And good morning, everyone. I am Don Zavis, National Sales Trainer, Sales Coach, International Keynote Speaker. Want to welcome you to our Friday sales training session. If it's Friday uh, at 11.30 here in the, new, in the old Pueblo, I'm going to be in front of these cameras. So I truly appreciate you being there. I know there's a lot of noise in the machine out there. And uh, the, the commitment and contribution you're making to your sales efforts uh, will come back to you many times over. Uh, as you can see also, I'm alone on the stage. Uh, Mr. Wechter's uh, foot problems continue, and fortunately, he's going to be having surgery next Thursday, so we'll keep in our thoughts and prayers, and I'll keep everybody updated to that. So uh, going through the litany, so if you're joining us on, on Zoom Live, thank you so much for being here. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, thank you so much for being here. If you're joining us on YouTube Live, thank you so much for being here, and if you're joining us on our Vimeo archive, we appreciate you being here as well. We've got a great session for you today. It's called Mental Architecture. Um, however, I generally like to set the sessions with kind of a sales current events. I mean, there, there's so much going on in the world today, and you know, I've, I've often said this: as salespeople, we don't really have the benefit of of blame. We we eat what we kill, so we can't go to our boss and say, you know, uh, sales is bad, nobody's buying, continue to pay me. We we eat what we kill. Most places, we if you sell something, you make money. If you don't sell something, you don't make money. So I think we're almost uniquely positioned in that situation where other people are not. And, and you've heard everything out there. You've, you know, unemployment has ticked up a little bit. Obviously, gas you know, varies where it is by a penny or two, but it's higher than ever. Uh, interest rates are going to be up. Supply chain issues, blah, 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 blah. Run down the dumpster fire of problems out there in the world. One of the interesting things about salespeople, however, is that we are built and adapted to overcome. We, we take whatever it's, you know, it's the proverbial, you take lemons and you make lemonade out of it. So uh, today's session is going to talk about some of the mental things that might be affecting that. But for those that are taking notes, I want you to write this down, but I want you to write it down in a way where I want you to look at it at least every day. So write it down, but then I would encourage you to print it, very large font, and put it somewhere in your workspace. Now, if you've got people that are working for you, I want you to put that in their workspace. And by the way, not just the people that are in sales. I believe that every person and every company has only one goal, which is to enhance and bring in revenue. I don't care if it's Sally's secretary at the desk. I don't care if it's the person that works in the lunchroom. It could be accounts payable or it doesn't make a difference. Their only goal is to bring in revenue and enhance the revenue of the company. So that being said, in the next 24 months, sales needs to be your number one concern. Come on, you can come in, come in. So I want you to write that down. So for the people that are joining us, I want you to write that down. But I want you to go one step further, and I want you to write it down in such a way where you can do it big fonts, white piece of paper, put it up in your workspace. Because it's so easy nowadays to get distracted by what we call work. So for example, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk to somebody. I'll say, what are you doing? And they're like, yeah, I was just reading you know, Advertising Times today. And it's, you know, you know, 1 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. Well, it doesn't take long to realize that's prime pay time activity. And we do sessions for pay time and no pay time. So the, the interesting thing is, is that so that's going to be your number one concern. I believe, as do many people in the economy, economics that I really kind of look to for counsel, they really think the next couple of years are going to be pretty challenging, whether it is you know, a gas well over $5. Don't assume that we're at the end point right now because there's nothing happening that's going to drive the price down. So imagine gas is going to be high. Food is going to be high. I was lamenting to, to Simona before the session started. I was going through my, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, fast food. And I was going through uh, McDonald's in the drive through And as I was placing my order, I said, I want one of those dollar large Cokes. And the woman behind the counter said, they're not a dollar anymore. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, they're $1.29. And I said, well, when did that happen? And she said, about a week ago. Now, obviously, if, if McDonald's succumbs to this, you know there's no hope for anybody. So I want you to put this in, in your workspace. And I want it to be a reminder. So in the next 24 months, sales needs to be your number one concern. Now, I don't want to say that all of the other stuff that you do isn't important. So if you're a CPA, I, I still need you to be a good CPA. If you're a plastic surgeon, you still need to be a good plastic surgeon. But I want you to take the time where you can focus on other things and, and really you know, kind of take that to heart. And there's a twofold aspect of that as well. 50% of the time that you're going to have available to do this, I want to go to new business. 
with 25% going to old business. So let's talk about the old business first before we jump into the actual session. Most people believe that because people bought from them last week, they're going to buy from them this week. And maybe there was a time when that made sense. There was that, you know, that, that annuity of relationships, right? You went to your dry cleaner and you always took your clothes to your dry cleaner because that's the dry cleaner you always went to. That's not the case anymore, right? You, you always went to the same dentist. Well, in reality, you can go to any dentist because however you present yourself that day is how the dentist is going to react. So if he's seen your teeth over the last 10 years, he's still basing what he's going to do on how you present today. So you want to have at least some time dedicated to prospecting for new business. So the obvious thing, networking, uh, certainly social media, uh, good old-fashioned cold calling, good old-fashioned walking in the door. I, I love doing that. Right? Or, or if I'm going to be at some place, I'll drop my business card in the windshield of the, the, the car to the right and left of me. And that way now I maximize what I do and how I do it. So all these things come into play and we do entire sessions where we talk about prospecting. So I'm not going to burden that time here. The second part of it is the old relationship. So in your 40 hour week, if you're losing those figures, you're going to be basing about 20 hours of your time, about 50% of your time, prospecting for new business, being out in the world, right? Uh, going to networking groups. That's a great way to go. Just being out in general. And I like to kind of reinforce that scenario with this statement. If you're taking notes, write this down. Every dollar that you've ever gotten, you got from somebody else. Every dollar that you've ever gotten, you got from somebody else. And the nice thing about that is every day, somebody else just shows up outside. You don't have to call them. You don't have to invite them. You don't have to do anything. They're there. They just show up every day waiting for you. So every dollar you've ever gotten, you've got from somebody else. You have to be an expert in somebody else. And that's why 50% of that time, or in a 40-hour week, and I know nobody works just 40 hours, but in our illustration, that would be 20 hours of prospecting. And I've had people say, well, what do you do for 20 hours? I will tell you, because I'm a product of the product. My commitment is that at least that period of time. Generally, I do well in advance of that. But the goal, again, is to let lots of people know. Most people struggle because an inadequate amount of people know they exist. Number two, I want you to write this down as well. And I think this will straighten up a lot of backbones because it is a departure from what a lot of people say. Most people, when times get tough, what do they do? Historically, they focus on ways to spend less, right? So times are tough, business is down, right? And, and you see this doom loop happen. I see it all the time. You know, times get tough and they cut their advertising, which now means less people know about them, which means they make less sales, which means they cut their advertising more which means now even less people know about them, and they make even less money. And you get this doom loop that spirals down. It's never, how much you, it's never how much you spend, it's only how much you make. And the reason that that, to me, is so profound is there is a finite, and I've said this in previous sessions, there's a finite amount that you can cut back. Literally, there, there is a finite amount. You, mean you could drive the worst car, eat the worst food, live in the crappiest place, blah, blah, blah. But there's a finite amount where you can't go any lower. But there's an infinite amount you can grow. And yet most people focus on the cutting back. How can we do less? How can we spend less? If they just put that energy to making just simple prospecting calls, while they're trying to figure out how to get that Indian to sit on the, you know, the head of the, you know, sit on the back of the buffalo and squeeze that nickel even more, if they just invested that time making prospecting, doing all the things that we're doing, not surprisingly, there's probably a pretty good chance that they'd get some good results out of it. So it's never how much you spend, it's always how much you make, because that's an infinite amount of doing it. Now, when you think of those two elements, here's what I want you to do, and then we're going to move on to the session. Number one. I want you to scrutinize every existing relationship you have now. Every existing relationship you have now, and I want you to go through two aspects. I want you to secure it, and I want you to enhance it. Secure it and enhance it. Why do you think Netflix wants you on a subscription? Why can't you work in Netflix and say, you know what, I'll turn it on again and turn it off, right? Because I might not need it for a week. So I shouldn't have to pay for that week. 
I should be able to turn it on when I want and turn it off when I want and pay for it when I want and not pay for it when I want. But Netflix says, well, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to charge you whether you watch it every day, every minute, or you never watch it at all. That's a subscription service. Because they realize that their strength is in securing that relationship, not having it be transactional. So for example, if you're a barber, you only get paid when somebody comes in and gets their hair cut. That's transactional. And if money gets tight, people might let their hair be a little bit shaggier for a little bit longer than it was. Why? Because that's a transactional relationship. That's an opportunity for them to save money immediately. So number one, in all relationships, I want you to secure that relationship. Move towards a, you know, some type of non-transactional type of thing, some kind of subscription. We can help you do that, almost regardless of the industry you're in. Number two, enhance what you have. Make it in such a way where it gets linked better so there isn't that ongoing relationship. So you're securing it and you're enhancing it. So when you get, for example, when you get an online subscription service of any kind, and I use that as an example, and the first thing they try to do is sell you more, right? Yeah, you sign up for this and it's $10 a month, right? Some real inexpensive. And as soon as you join, and by the way, they told you how great it was, right? For a mere $10 a month, you get this amazing, spectacular thing. And as soon as you get, you know, as soon as you sign up, then they tell you how much it sucks, and the real good one is this one, right? The embellished version of that. So you want to secure and enhance all those relationships. All right. Number two, keeping in mind, I want you to do a revenue mind map. Now, this is a freestanding session, but I think that this is so critical to our session today, and I want to make sure we stay on time because we got lots and lots and lots to cover. What a revenue mind map is, you in the center. And it talks about all the ways that you can make money. See, most people think that they only make money from one revenue stream. And most people, by the way, do. They make money from one revenue stream. And that's why if your one revenue stream is your job, right? You're working for XYZ company. And God forbid you get fired by XYZ company, your one and only revenue stream is gone. And that's why people go crazy, right? They, they jump off of buildings and they do crazy stuff because their one and only revenue stream gets severed. But what if you had four or five or six or seven different revenue streams? When one turns off, one turns on. When one goes down, one goes up. Every successful relationship I've ever met and every successful wealthy person I've ever met had money coming in from lots of different pseudo non-associated areas. For example, there was a period of time when Tiger Woods made more money from his endorsements than he ever made through the PGA. Now think about that. He's known for being an amazing golfer, and he truly was. And it wasn't like he didn't make a lot of money through the PGA. He actually made more money from his endorsements, Nike and Taylor and all the other ones. And then he, then he started doing personal appearances for Buick, right? And then started selling this kind of clothes, and then was doing this for this. You had revenue coming in for lots of different areas. A revenue mind map will help you get there. Because what it talks about is you in the center. So I'm just going to say, for example, and we'll use Tiger Woods because we've already used him. So Tiger obviously has lots of different ones. One of the ones is certainly the PGA, right? What he got that came in from the PGA. But what else did he do? All right, well, he did cars, Buick. He, was, he, he advertised for Buick. What else did he do? Well, he had his personal endorsements. He had Nike. I think he was Taylor Golf as well, if I remember correctly. All right? He was doing a hotel chain. And there was probably, and there was a book and a video that he did. And you can see what happens that you have lots and lots and lots and lots of money coming in from different areas. So when he was unable to play golf, which there was a period of time he couldn't because he had some substantial back injuries, he still had all of these other things percolating. Now, nobody wants to lose business, obviously. But it makes it a lot more tolerable when you're only losing it from one location. Now, most people only think of themselves in just that. They only think of themselves in that direct, clear scenario. So by the way, I'm glad that you're here, Stephanie, because I'm going to use you as an example in this. I actually pre-thought of this. So uh, Stephanie and her husband, Randy, uh, uh, do a, uh, can I say a comedy club just for illustration? Yeah. Okay. Clean. So, clean. clean comedy club, very important. 
So the idea ultimately is that they would bring in clean comedians and they would have people come in and, and for that they would get paid. They would pay some modest amount of money. They would have a wonderful show. They'd have a great enjoyable evening and out they would go. Now for most people, if they were looking at Stephanie's mind map, they would only see one little circle, which would say clean comedy show. But what are some other things that Stephanie could do with that same concept? Now, I'm not gonna put you on the spot because I've already figured these out. All right. Good, thank you. All right. Well, I'm just going to use one because I just want to use one as an example because we got a, we got a lot to cover in the actual session. But what if Stephanie and her husband, in their infinite wisdom, said, "You know what? I already ha I've got this clean comedy show that we do, you know, a couple of times a month, and people love it and they come. But there's probably a lot of other people out there that would love to be a stand-up comedian and do clean comedy. So I'm going to make a drum roll, please." Clean comedy school, where I'm going to have some of the comedians that come in who are actually the clean comics. And I'm going to say, if you come and do my thing, I'm going to ask you to come an hour earlier than the actual show, because I'm going to have a school. And I'm actually going to charge some people a, a modest amount of money that are interested in being stand-up comics but don't want to be vulgar and, and dirty and all that other stuff. They want to be a clean comic. Now Stephanie potentially has a new revenue stream that she hasn't thought about before. Now, the interesting thing about it is, is that most people, when they present to, my, to me, they only have the one that they think of. They'll bring to me and say, I only think this. But by the time we get done with this exercise, it's amazing how many other ones that we filled up and how many different revenue streams are readily available for you to take advantage of. So when one turns on, one turns off. When one goes up, one goes down. So, did, is that, so I wanted to use you as that example because to me, that to me is another revenue stream. So even if it's a couple of hundred dollars for the person that always saw themselves as a stand-up comic, that's a couple of hundred dollars per person that you weren't getting before, that people are more than happy to pay. So the idea of a revenue mind map and then each one of these has little branches. So for example, if you had one that said uh, new business. So say for example, Stephanie, what would you need to get your clean comedy school off the ground? Well, maybe we need a flyer. Sure, we need a flyer. We need some way to tell people about that. Maybe we want to make a Facebook page. And it's going to be called Stephanie's Clean Comedy School. Right? Clean stand-up comedy school. Yes. Facebook. What else? Maybe we need to have a place. We need to have a place that we're going to have our clean comedy school. And you can see all of the things that generate off of this bulb. Now, you can even have things generate off of the individual bulbs, for example. Say, for example, you wanted to have a picture on your flyer. And maybe you wanted a picture of, of a crowd standing on their feet and just uh, giving a standing ovation. Well, now we need a picture to put to our flyer, to put to our clean comedy school. And that's how a revenue mind map works. In a name, and it's a living document, by the way. It's not something we turn on and turn off. An example I gave in a previous session, I have a client of mine who's an engineer. And he actually makes more money teaching guitar that he actually makes it his engineering job. He charges $25 a half hour. He loves guitar. And he's an amazing guitar player, by the way, on top of that. And just about every moment that he could be filled playing guitar and teaching guitar, he's got people. He turns people away. He was making 50 bucks an hour teaching guitar in his basement, something he already loves. And he'd already be playing his guitar, even if these people weren't there. And that came as a result of our revenue mind map. So that keeps you in mind that each one of us has lots of different ways to make money. We may not know it yet, but there's lots of ways we can make money, and we can, and we can sure help you get there. So let's jump in today's session. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip this over and try to use the sticky on top if we can here. And I'm going to draw a picture. And keep in mind, I'm not a very good drawer, but I'll do the best that I possibly can to get my point across. Just to let you know, Lady Gaga would do the same thing. If nobody was buying her albums or, she, or uh, nothing, Lady Gaga would still be playing her music to her friends. 
Absolutely. Most, most, it's interesting, it, it, and that's a good segue, even though it's, it's not part of the session. If you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. You'll never work a day in your life. So today's session is called Mental Architecture. So for those that are writing this, I'll write this down. I'm going to draw something up here. And when we get done, I want, I'm going to go around the room and I'm going to ask you something about this, OK? OK. So what we have is nine boxes in this box right here. So Stephanie, I'm going to ask you, um, does that look right or wrong to you? Be honest. It looks funny. OK, why does it look funny? Well, because uh, you, you just have that one square out there, and, and, and it's only connected by one thing, but then all the rest of them are connected right. by each so, other. So for you, in order for this to look correct, if I did this, would it look correct? It's getting there. Does that look correct? Yeah, it's not a, it's not OK, a Cody, what about you? When you, when you saw these nine in that box right there, what, did it look right to you? Um, By the way, there's no right or wrong answer, so I'm not, I'm not this isn't a gotcha like, moment. Uh, why is that box out there by itself? Exactly. Right. And most people, and, and Steve, how, what was your feeling? It looks fine to me. Okay. With that box open, sure. right? Perfect. Because what happens is there's two schools of thought that go along with this exercise. It's scarcity versus abundance, because some of the people that I work with when they see these nine boxes in this box right here, they say it's incomplete. That we need to have this box here and this box here in order for it to be complete. There are other people that look at it and say, looks fine to me, that extra box is OK. It's just nine boxes and an extra box. That's the way I see it, too. I see nine boxes and an extra box. And that fundamentally supports the idea of mental architecture as abundance versus scarcity. I, when I look at this, I say there's nine boxes and an extra one because my, my mental architecture is abundance. There are, and this, again, there's no, there's, this isn't a wrong situation. It's just this, you know, this is the technique of it. Other people that have a mental architecture of <coughs> scarcity say this is incomplete. In order for this to be right, you need to have the boxes because all the boxes need to be, there's not enough here to make it be right. Whereas an entire half of the population says, yes, this is right, and there's an extra. There's more than we need, as opposed to the other group, which says there's less than we need. So we are going to talk about the idea of abundance versus scarcity. And we talk about mental architecture. This is a critical action, because this is how you think. Abundance versus scarcity. Now, by the way, this is not something that is, this is something that's created over your lifetime. And it's how you think about money. It's how you think about a lot of things. And again, there's no right and wrong answer here. This is just a tool that we're going to use to increase our selling abilities. And a lot of it goes back. So if you remember when you were younger, right? And because historically, that's how we all learned about money and life and what's appropriate and such. And many people came from families that maybe didn't have as much. And, and their conversation sounded like this. Money doesn't grow on trees. What do you think? I have a money tree in the backyard. See? I don't, I, don't even, I don't even need to finish the words, right? You know, what do you think I'm made of? Money. Money? Right? All these things come out of, and, and, and through years and years, you know, it's not polite to talk about money, right? And all these parts and pieces. And they all have this effect on us when we're younger and our relationship with money. Now, interestingly enough, I didn't have that, right? I came from a very well to do family. My father owned the company, we had tons of money. He always had a new Lincoln every six months. You know, boxes at sporting events and stuff, knew everybody and their brother. I never had that. I came from a world where there was always enough. And not even enough, there was more than you really, really needed. And I, even at a young age, I was very involved in the finances of the family. So if you think of the Rockefellers and the Kennedys and you look at any well-to-do family, that's generational wealth. So the kids understand that, you know, they have something when they get old enough to understand. Whereas in a lot of other places, nobody has any idea what mom, mom and dad die. They have no idea what they have until they start you know, wheedling through things. 
So those mental tapes that we play in our head go over and over and over and over again. Because in this situation, that little tape is coming out and says it's impolite to talk about money. Now, I, as a sales trainer, I'm saying what? Let's talk about money. Well, that's friction. That's going to rub against itself. That's going to rub differently on different people depending on how they were brought up. See, and that's why this simple exercise helps us because I believe there's more than enough for everybody. I believe that everybody can be a multimillionaire. I think that there's an unlimited amount of sunsets, sunrises, laughs, happy times, money, business, prospects. I hear it all the time. There's nobody for me to talk to. What are you talking about? There are millions of people for you to talk to, right? The, here's the problem. They're not in your basement, which is where you are. But when you're out in the world, there's millions of people to talk to. And when you break that idea, because you can switch from that abundance personality to scarcity, which is probably not a good thing for you, or from the scarcity to abundance. And you do that by, by kind of training yourself a different way, understanding that it's OK to talk about money. We're all in the money business. And there's nobody in this room that, that's, a, that's a nonprofit, or at least not by intention. right? So the idea, ultimately, is we are in the money business. And our relationship with money is one that's going to have a very profound effect. Because it's interesting, you know, if, if you use, we talk about practical versus abstract, right? And, and I love to use this line, right? You know, you know who, who would like to live in a million dollar house, you know, $10 million for a dollar a week? Well, everybody's going to put their hand up, right? So on the abstract, everybody wants to live in a multi million dollar house. But when you move to the practical, which means you actually have to afford it, that's when it drops off, right? Every business should be advertising in the newspaper. I think if you ask 100 business people, would your business benefit from advertising in newspapers, magazines, media? I think 100% of the people would say yes, absolutely. But when you move from the abstract to the practical, that's where it falls off. And it falls off because of risk. We fear everything. Even the things we don't have, we fear. Right? The little bit we have, we're so afraid of losing that that we want to treat it like that china egg. You know, we want to take that light and we want to put it underneath the bushel basket because we think if everybody sees our light, it's, it's going to be worthless. Now, in sales, that's not the case. Most companies, most businesses, and most individuals struggle because an inadequate amount of people know they exist. So if I could snap my finger and everybody on the earth knew about your wonderful clean comedy show. Snap my finger, everybody on the earth knows it. You would have hundreds of thousands of people lined up. Why? Because they got the message, the message resonated with them, and they're going to be there. But historically, that's not the case. We can't snap our finger. And most people struggle, most businesses struggle, most new companies go out of business because an inadequate amount of people know they exist. And it's all based on risk. Most people are afraid, and they go into scarcity mode, right? Scarcity of time, scarcity of effort. I can't tell you how many people, when the clock says 5 o'clock, in their mind, they're mentally done. And I will often ask them and say, why, why are you done? You know, un unless something's happening. If you're doing something at 5 o'clock, well, that's one thing. But why is 5 o'clock the time when you shut off? Why isn't when you are done the time you shut off? So if you've got you know, five calls you've got to make and 20 emails in your email box and 10 messages, text messages you've got to respond to, why do you push them at 5 o'clock to some other time? Why? Scarcity. That's a time. Scarcity is money. They know they would benefit from advertising. They know they would benefit from a lot of things. And yet they don't. Fundamentally, their, their mindset is one of incompleteness. Right? I don't want to, I've only got $10,000 less. I don't want to take a chance with it. Now, again, I'm not a smart guy. But if you do nothing with that, now I'm not saying be stupid or frivolous, but if you do nothing with that, in what world will something happen because of that? Nothing. And today, I mean, we're talking, what, less than 1% interest rate and a bank, Cody? Yeah. I, you know, yeah. And I remember a time where there were some countries in the world that had negative interest. They actually charged you to hold their money, your money, in their bank. And if you don't think we're heading there, you're a fool. We're absolutely heading there. 
Yeah, we're absolutely going to be heading there. Okay, so because of the risk, this scarcity mentality says, well, I, I went to that networking group and I didn't get anything of it. I'm not going to go back again. That's crazy thinking. A lot of crazy people in the world, right? Um, I put an ad in that newspaper and nobody called me. I'm never going to do that again. I, I put a social media post up and nobody contacted me back. Right? I, uh, you know, I went to this. I did this. I went, to, I, and nothing ever happened. And the example I love to use is, is this one. So, and, and so, Stephanie, let me ask you a question. Okay. okay. Did you marry the first person that you ever went on a date with? No. 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 Okay. But then, how come you didn't say that's it? I went on a date. That's it. I'm done with men. I went on my date. It sucked. This guy's an idiot. I'm never going to do it again. Why not? Yeah, you think? Yeah. And yet most people with that scarcity mentality, when I use that illustration, they're like, well, if I, I'm not going to, you know, I went on one date. I'll, you know, I might have to go, you know, and, I'm, and I want to put you on the, 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 the spot here about your previous dating prowess, right? But there's a good chance you may have gone on more than one date and still not found Mr. Right, as we've all had. And yet, for some reason, that makes sense to the people, but all the other stuff doesn't. Because all the other stuff contains risk. It's a requirement. It takes time. It takes money. And we frequently say, especially in our COVID-19 post world, you may have to work twice as hard and invest twice as much, potentially, is to get the same results you did before. So the illustration that we use is that if you're having your advertising, you might be spending $1,000 a month on advertising. You might have to spend $2,000 a month on advertising to potentially get the same results. If you were making 20 cold calls before, you may have to make 40 now to get the same results. But most people would never do that. Why? Risk. Because all through their life, they got this scarcity message, right? Save for a rainy day, you know, the you know, chicken little, the sky is falling, you know, doom is right around the corner. And, and again, I never had that. I never had, I came from this, right? Now, I'm sure there were times where my dad just really struggled, right? As I grew older, I knew how many times he you know, was very, very close to the end, as all business people are at least one point in time or, or another. Now, I didn't know that because he didn't share that. As far as we were concerned, there was plenty of money, right? My mom's philosophy, there's checks in the checkbook. We got money. <laughs> all right? Now, in reality, I, I know that not to be true. But when you get that daily diet of that for the longest of times, it doesn't make, you don't have that same fear. So for me to have a, con and we're all in the money business, by the way. So for me to have a conversation about money right in the beginning is just very much in line with what we've always done. You look at the most successful business people, right? They start talking about money right off the get-go, right? You, you know, you look at some of the most recent, Tesla or, or uh, Twitter, right? You know, Twitter came in. That comes out of the blue, right? Here's a guy that you know, just basically tells the world, hey, I put a tender offer you know, of this for this. Is, you know, it's you know, what, $44 billion or something like that. That just kind of came out of the blue. Nobody's like, where the hell did that come from? Right? Now, but, but as you watched it unfold in front of you, that person has no problem talking about money. Well, at that time, he had, the most, he had the number one most profitable company on the world at that time when he put his order. Now, it's not the case now, but when he put his uh, Twitter offer in. He comes from an abundance philosophy. Therefore, talking about money is okay. We are in the money business, and that's why mental architecture is such a critical element, because you sell like you feel. If you feel strong, if you feel emboldened, if you don't feel needy, and you could tell when a salesperson's needy, it's when you say, you know what, give me some time to think about it, and they call you the next day and say, have you had enough time? <laughs> you know? Well, but some people do, right? You can sense when that person is desperate, when they're needy. Why? Because they're coming from this idea of scarcity. If I don't sell you, I'm never going to sell anybody again. You know, I have a standing rule. If it doesn't make sense today, rarely does it ever make sense tomorrow. I can't think of any scenario, and I hear this a lot from, from people, because I'll ask them, what's your biggest problem? And they'll say, well, I have prospects who say they want to think it over. Okay. So here's what I say. Okay, Mr. Jones, what does your think it over process look like? Right? 
it's, what is it? What is it? You're telling me you're going to think it over? I'm okay with that. Does that mean you do a Google search and then you go to the library and you interview five of your friends and you get Fortune magazine? And because if that if that's what you say you do, I get that. That maybe that makes sense. Most people think it over just what they tell the salesperson to get rid of them. When you're out of the picture, they don't think about you at all. The person says, "Let me sleep on it." I can't remember one time in my life where I went to bed thinking no and woke up thinking yes. But we as salespeople take that all the time. I had one lady say, I want a prayer. I, I love this line. And, and take no offense, anybody who's watching, because I'm a devout Catholic, right? Had one lady said, I want to pray over it. You know what I said? Why do you think I'm here? Why do you think I'm here? Out of the 100 million people I could have called, out of the blue, I called you. How do you think that happened? You think that's a, you think that's a mistake? You think that's just random coincidence? No, it's not. I believe there is no coincidences in the world. Nothing happens by accident. So I want to be able to move this, uh, this, this mindset away from the scarcity, that every dollar that I get, I take away from somebody else. That's not the case at all. I, I believe that every dollar I put into circulation, I get 10 more back. Because when I put a dollar into that ad, sure, it may not give me a call this week or this month, but somebody's going to see it. And the next person I see at a network and they say, oh, yeah, I saw your ad in the XYZ. Now, that ad may not have run for six months, but at that time, they remembered it. Scarcity versus abundance. There is more than enough of everything. I hear people say, oh, my God, I'm so busy. So busy. 24 hours in a day. By the way, it's the same person who watches TV for four hours. You want to hear how, you want to feel how slow time goes? Light a candle and put your hand over it. This is what the seconds sound like. Kick. Kick. Right? No. There's plenty of time for everything if you commit to doing it. So abundance versus scarcity is risk. The next aspect of it is, and I'll put this down here, procrastination. Well, you know, let me write it different. Let me sort my coffee here. I'll make sure I get this in order because I don't want to confuse you. All right? So procrastination versus perfectionism. ISM. Procrastination versus perfectionism. Again, when you're talking about mental architecture, this is something that is critical for salespeople. Most salespeople understand and they kind of idealize themselves on the I'll do it tomorrow scenario. Right? Cody, I use you as an example when we first got started, right? I'll do it tomorrow. Here's the problem with that mindset. The dollar I don't get today, I don't necessarily get to tomorrow. So the dollar I don't get today, I don't necessarily get to tomorrow. In many cases, today's dollar is lost. And that's why if you remember when you, my grandparents used to say, Worry about today, tomorrow will take care of itself. Because you can't, you can't change the past, obviously. There's no guarantee of a future, obviously. The only thing we can influence is right now, the present, this minute. The problem being is, is that so much procrastination in the world. People know what they need to do. They know they need to exercise. But they say, well, I'm going to start next week, next month. I hear, you know, I, I love the people say, you know, that New Year's resolution. I'm going to stop smoking on January 1st. I'm going to start working out. Right? Had a, I had a club back in Michigan. And I'm a pretty friendly guy. So pretty much anybody who was new in the club, a new face, they're like, hi, I'm Don Zavis, and nice to meet you. Well, after about year six, I realized, you know what? That's just too damn hard. And, and I'm only going to introduce myself to the people that were there in February. So if you were there in February, I'm going to introduce myself to you. Why? Because the first Monday after the new year, club was filled, right? Five o'clock in the morning to capacity. Every shower used, every machine was used, everything was used. Why do you think that was? New Year's resolution. Absolutely, sure. Everybody's going to get fit. We're going to work out. We're going to go to the gym. And then the next day, a little less. And the next day, a little less. And the next day, a little less. Until eventually, I said, you know what? If you're there for the month of January, now we're in February, maybe you're going to hold on. I'm going to introduce myself to you. But here's the reality. Every day only comes once a year, always. 
There's no difference between May 22nd and January 1st. Why? They only come once a year. But yet most people are built with the mental architecture of procrastination. I'll prospect tomorrow. I'll go to a networking group next week. I'll, I'll, I'll have lunch with my most important clients you know, next month. I'll take care of it after the beginning of the year. You know, uh, you know, Christmas is coming up, nobody's working, so I'm not going to do anything in December. Because in their mind, the mental architecture of their mind procrastinates because the mental architecture is perfectionism. The perception is if it's not perfect, don't even do it. So, you know, instead of just saying, you know what, I'm just going to do a Google search of whatever my prospects would be and whatever comes up with the people I'm going to call today. And I've had people work on their calling list, right? The people that say, well, I got to be more serious about making cold calls. I've watched people invest a week developing their call list, not making the calls, developing the list of people to make the calls to. That entire week was done. You know what I said? Pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. Call anybody. I, I, I worked with a gentleman one time. I don't know if I shared this. I think I did share with maybe with the camera. Uh, for a week, guy was opening a new business. Every day, I would get three and four iterations of what his business card looks like. Should I use this font or this font? Should I put, put the picture in the right-hand corner or the bottom corner? Uh, you know, should I use, you know, should I put this in? Should I back do this? Should I have a photograph? Should I have this? Should we have our name up here and the phone number down here? Should we have the phone number down here and the name up here? Finally, on Thursday, I'm like, shut up. Stop this. Pick up the goddamn phone. People don't care. Your business card is meaningless. You know who cares about your business card? Your mom. That's who cares about your business card is your mom. It's going to be on the refrigerator so she can tell her friends. Nobody else does. I never got a piece of business because people went, ooh, what a pretty card. Right? That doesn't make any difference. And yet, in his mind, because the card wasn't right, then what should I not do? Anything. My business card's not right. I shouldn't do anything. The mental architecture they had was one of incompleteness. It needs the two other boxes to be complete. I, on the other hand, said, I didn't have a business card for three months. Finally, people say, you got a business card? I'd say, no. i say, you got a piece of paper? They go, yup. i go, I got a business card. I'd write my name, my phone number, and email address. There you go. There's my business card. Why? Because I didn't care about it. it wasn't, the business card itself meant nothing. It was the contact information that was the most critical information on it. So the procrastinative tendencies, again, it's the mental architecture of perfectionism. If it's not perfect, don't do it, right? It's 4 o'clock, uh, nobody's working, and I don't make cold calls. Uh, you know, it's 5 o'clock, it's the day, be uh, one thing I always love, the day after Thanksgiving. Now, we do a training session the day after Thanksgiving. Interestingly enough, one of the best attended sessions was the day after Thanksgiving. Now, if you think about that, that should be the you know, worst attended. There should be nobody watching us. They should all be doing family crap the day after Thanksgiving. We have more attendance, especially on the online services, the day after Thanksgiving. Now, go figure. But there's a whole world of people out there in their mind that are saying, what about the day after Thanksgiving? Nobody's working. Everybody's in the mall shopping. That's not true. The, the architecture of a perfectionist mentality manifests itself in procrastination. They don't do the very things they know they need to do, whether it's start exercising. You know when you start exercising? Today, right now. Right? Sean Knotts, my trainer back in Michigan, he was Mr. Michigan for two years in a row. This guy is literally two Dons. I weigh 175 pounds. This guy is three plus. He's literally two Dons. Right? Just giant. He's a mountain. You know what he says you need to exercise? Because so many people say, well, I'm going to join a health club, and i got to go buy you know, weights and barbells, and got to buy the right clothes, and if i got to go, you know, got to go buy a $5,000 Peloton bike so I can, I can learn to ride. You know what Sean says you need to exercise? The ground. As long as you have the ground, you can exercise. Because most of the best things exercise uses the ground. Now, I can't speak for everybody, but pretty much everywhere I go, the ground goes with me. No matter what hotel I'm in, any place, the ground seems to follow me every single place. Stopping smoking, eating better, sleeping better, 
All these things, making prospecting calls, going to networking events, being out in the world, taking what you do seriously. Why? Because if you don't take it seriously in the next 24 months, you're going to get killed. Right? The things that are going to kill these industries, when you, you, know, you, know, you double or triple interest rates, you now wipe out mortgage and real estate, which trickles into appliances, carpeting, tile, paint, roofing, everybody and their brother. The ripples are going to be high and they're going to be significant. You have to take yourselves very, very important. So the procrastinative tendencies, again, are a manifestation of that perfectionist mentality. Let me give you one more illustration and we'll move on from there because I want to make sure we stay on time. We've got lots and lots to cover. All right. I'm going to give you an illustration which I think helps because I think the average person can take this. So say, for example, you've got to clean your garage. Now, I will tell you, in my garage back in Michigan, it was a full day effort for me to properly clean my garage. You get everything out. Right, you sweep it, you wash it, you wash down the walls, do the windows, right? You know, clean it. You really do a really good job on your garage. Took me six hours. I'm not saying everybody, but it took me a good six hours to do. Now, in my mind, historically, I knew that I really never had a six-hour block of time available to do it all at once. But I did have an hour a day, six days in a row. So I would say after dinner, right? We get done about 6:30. I'm going to go out, and for the next hour or so, I'm going to clean the garage. And I'm going to clean it like a clock. I'm going to start at 7 o'clock on the left-hand side, and then I'm going to move up here the next day and this day, and I'm going to go around and around and then back and back until by the sixth day, the garage is clean. Now, that makes sense to me. Why? Because I believe there's more than enough time. I believe in the abundance. I believe that, but for the person that has that procrastinative tendency, that is a manifestation of perfectionism in the mental architecture, what do they say to themselves? If I don't have six hours at one time, might as well not do it. Might as well not do it, right? And, and their mind is, well, if I clean this, and six days later, the thing that I did in the beginning, well, that might be dirty again. Right? That's a pretty compelling message. That's the way they think. Now, this has such a profound effect on sales, though, because most of what we do is based on how we feel. You sell like you feel. If you feel strengthened, if you feel empowered, I love to use this illustration. Imagine you just made the biggest sale in the history of your company. Not, not just the biggest, the biggest by 10 times. Whatever the biggest thing your company ever did, you just sold 10 times that amount. You made a ridiculous amount of money on, uh, you, you made more in your commission on this one sale than you did the last three years, right? You blew your quota away for the next five years. You walk on water, right? Unless you shoot the CEO between the eyes, you're never going to get fired. The next person you talk to, they'll get the real you. What do you think? Why would you think that, Stephanie? The next person you talk to after making that big giant sale, why are they going to get the real you? Well, because you hold confidence and you, uh, you, you have faith in yourself. You have confidence in yourself. And exactly. You, and you know you can do it. Exactly. Sure. You know. Sure. You're not desperate. You're not needy. You don't feel weak. You feel empowered. You, not, not, not emblazoned. But you feel empowered, right? You, that's why it's so important. And that's why we talk about mental architecture. You sell like you feel. If you feel strong and you feel empowered, you know, you talk to you know, very wealthy people. Some of them are really, really nice. Why? Because why in the world do they have to be mean? Why be mean? Yeah. Exactly. They don't so, need you. Rich people don't need you. <laughs> we like being happy, right? Yeah. But the idea ultimately is that you want to be able to sell like you feel. So if you feel engaged and empowered, you feel you know, like, you know, wonderful about your industry and lots of positive stuff, that's how you're going to sell. But if you feel weak and, and you feel frustrated and, and, you, and you feel disheartened, well, you're going you're gonna to sell like that. Right? If you haven't made a sale in a while and things are kind of desperate, right? they can sense it. It's almost, it's almost like how an animal can, can kind of sense when you're apprehensive. I, I love to use the example when my daughter was young. We had a horse, Paradigm Rising Sun. Beautiful Morgan, just, just beautiful. And, and by the way, when my daughter was 12, she was number two in the United States for walk, trot, canter with Morgans. Right? So 
Good, some pretty good stock right there, right? Hey, golf clap, right? Well, this, this horse, Perry, it, you know, it's funny because Cass, when she was 12, I mean, you know, she was, she was a 12-year-old. And she would grab this horse. I mean, literally, she would leap up and she would grab the horse around the neck and the horse would like swing her around off the thing and she would pull its hair and jump on its back and, you know, kiss it and nuzzle it and do all that stuff. And that horse never did anything aggressive whatsoever. Right, that horse loved her. Right, if she got in there and she was in the she was in the paddock area and something spooked the horse, that horse would never think of slamming her up against the wall. Nothing like that. And keep in mind, this is like a 15, 1600 pound horse. My daughter was I don't know what 80, maybe 75 when you're 12. I don't I don't know. I'm not good at the weight part of it. That horse would see me, so I would be coming in. So the cast would dangle around that horse. That horse would see me come around the horn. The horse would do this. And he would just look at me because he knew that I was a little bit uncomfortable around horses. But because he sensed my uncomfortableness, therefore, he was uncomfortable. It's like a dog, right? You can get the biggest, meanest dog on the face of the earth. If that dog doesn't feel you're uncomfortable, he's not going to be uncomfortable. But if that dog feels your apprehensiveness, what's the first thing it does? It feels apprehensive. Your clients feel that too. They feel like they're trying to be sold. They know when you're trying to sell them. They can smell it. Because when we think like this, when we act like this, when our mental architecture is one of fear and, 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 and apprehensiveness and worry, they sense that. You sell like you feel. If you feel engaged, if you feel empowered, you're going to sell like that. If you feel weak, if you feel needy, if you feel that things aren't going in your direction, you're going to sell like that as well. And a lot of it is actually steeped in, in, the, in the medical nature of what we do. We have the right brain, left brain. Right? We have the right brain and we have the left brain. We have different aspects of our neurology which reflect how we do. There's aspects of our brain that are creative that engage art and music and other areas. And there's aspects of our brain that, that talk about numbers and see things in terms of logic and, and, and try to make sense out of the world. That's why you see people, they'll look at a cloud and they'll see a lion in the cloud, right? Or they'll see an elephant you know, in, their, in their French toast. Our, our brain tries to do that. It tries to make sense of the world around us. And, and paradelia, which is what makes you see an elephant in your toast, is our brain struggling to do that. It's when somebody does something stupid and our brain struggles to try to figure out why when it's just stupid. And it's interesting that I tell people all the time, it's your prospect's God-given right to be stupid. It really is. It's their God-given right to be stupid. And most of us as salespeople, when we first get into sales, we struggle with that. Because we say, well, if I can show you Mr. Jones on paper, why blah bitty blah bitty blah bitty blah bitty well, it would, of course, make sense. Who, who wouldn't want to come to a wonderful comic event for less money than they're going to waste probably at their local theater and have a wonderful experience and leave laughing? Who would not want to be there? I think everybody would. I think you go back to the, aspect, you go back to the abstract versus practical. And if I would said, who would love a wonderful night out with a great clean comedian you could bring the whole family to, you can laugh, you could have a great time, and really, really enjoyable for less money than it's going to take you to go to your local AMC theater, who would say no to that? I think 100%. Turn down the family and it's tonight for Anna. There you go. So if you think about that, so on the abstract, everybody's going to say yes. But on the practical, and that because as it goes to the practical, you start kicking in this procrastination, this perfectionism. Even though you know that it's better, you know that it's fun, you know it's the right thing to do, right? The logical part of your brain is saying, you should do this. The logical part of your brain says, don't smoke. The logical part of your brain says, be more fit. The logical says, sleep better. Don't take drugs, don't drink, all the things, don't eat fast food, all the things. And I'm, by the way, I am the poster child for guilt because I like bourbon, Killians, and cigars. So I, trust me, I'm not casting any aspersions. Because we all know what we need to do, and yet we don't do it. But then we're terribly surprised by the outcome. Right? We're, we're all frustrated because we haven't made the sales we want or we're not making the money we want. We're convinced because we look at social media, everybody else's life is amazing. Everybody else's life is amazing. Right? 
And I, and I go to social media, somebody I know whose life is in, in just in, in the pits, and I go, holy crap, that looks a lot different from what I know. Way to go there, buddy. Right? But the reality is you can't hide from yourself. Right? You can't kid yourself. You can't lie to yourself. When everybody's gone and it's just you, you know what the truth is. This better be your truth. Right here. Right there. The next 24 months, sales is number one. Right? You have a wife. You have a husband. You have children. They rely on you. Everything that they are and everything that they're going to have initially is because of your success or lack of success. Take this seriously. Take this seriously. I've been poor and I've been rich. Poor sucks. All right? If you're there now, you don't have to be. Let's keep going. So you have right brain and left brain. So we know about the, the idea, that the physiology of what we do and how we do it. The next part is we call OK, not OK. Because we live in a world where people want retribution. They want revenge. They're angry, right? It's the person that makes a post on social media, and 10 people got to jump on them. 10 people got to jump and say terrible things. Why wouldn't you just ignore it and just delete that person from your feed and never look at their stuff again, right? If, you know, 30 years ago, if you had, you know, if you had, you're young, so this is going to count for you, right? But 30 years ago, if you had a bad meal at a restaurant, what would you not do? Exactly. You wouldn't go back, right? You would say, you know what, I went to XYZ, I really didn't have a good experience, I'm not going to go back again. Now we feel the need to do what to XYZ? Not just not go back. Absolutely. We want to crucify them. We want to cripple them, even though it might be a who the hell knows why. Maybe that was the one time out of 9 million that whatever they, food they got was bad, whatever the circumstances were. Now we're angry. The world is frustrated. They want to see you suffer. They want to see you fail. There are people, by the way, in your very world, right? especially if you're a commission person, they want to see you fail. And I, it's interesting, and I say this all the time, you'll know when you're successful when you have no friends that you grew up with. That's a terrible thing to say. Because what happens is your success, friends, family members, coworkers, whatever, shines a glaring light on their failure. Because if you're the top salesperson in your company, and all the other salespeople are saying what? Oh, the economy's bad, and nobody's buying, and blah, 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 and you are? You're selling a ton of stuff. You think that shines the glaring light on everyone else's position? Absolutely. That's why when we talk about OK, not OK. If you make your clients feel OK, they'll want you around. If you make people not feel not OK, they're not going to want you around. So I hear this a lot. People come to me and say things like that. Well, I'm a terrible salesperson. Whoa. Terrible salesperson. You say that about yourself. You teach your brain how to think. Absolutely. You that, exactly. That's why this is mental architecture. If you think you're amazing and you really think you're amazing, you'll have no problem letting other people know that. I think I'm amazing, right? I am, I am no shrinking violet, right? I, you know, I'm the poster child for excessive self-promotion. But the idea is most people live in a world where they want to make people not OK. They're OK if they make people feel bad. And they believe that, that if they make somebody else feel bad, they make themselves feel better because of somebody else feeling bad. So when somebody comes to me and says, well, Don, you're going to have your hands full with me because I'm a terrible salesperson. I could say, well, you come to the right pace because I'm amazing and, and I could take the worst person in the world, right? You know, you ever see Breakfast at Tiffany's, right? Well, that's going to be, you know, no. No, that's not the case at all. You know what I say? You're not supposed to be great at this. You're probably right where you deserve to be. I do this seven days a week. Of course I'm going to be better than you. A soft spot to land. Somebody comes and says, I'm terrible with handling money. And there are some people who say, well, that's why you come to me, because I'm amazing. And, right? No. You know what? Most people aren't good with handling money. Right? You're just where you need to be. Soft spot to land. Why? Because if you make people feel OK around you, they're going to stay. If you make them feel not OK, what are they going to do? Leave. They're going to leave, right? They will never remember what you say. They will never remember what you do. 
but they will remember how you made them feel. feel. Exactly. So you want to be able to touch into that part of the relationship, into the, going back to mental architecture, right? It's almost like aligning the way that you think with somebody else to make sure that you can use that in such a way where it works efficiently and effectively. You want to make them feel OK. And you do that by providing no pressure. I love to sit down with people and say, look, I don't know if I can help you. All right, let's get a beer. You tell me your woes. If I can, I will. If I can't, I'm going to say I can't. And what you'll find is, is that just drops that defensive pressure because what they fear is somebody saying, oh, don't worry, Mr. Jones, we've got the perfect thing for you. Well, that's not possible, right? There's, it's not possible to have the perfect thing for everybody on the face of the earth. There's going to be somebody maybe that it's not perfect for. That's why making them feel OK. So how will you make them feel OK? Right? Well, one of the ways is meet them in their home, if that happens to be appropriate. Now, maybe in your case, not appropriate, but meet them in their home. Mrs. Jones, I'll tell you what. Invite me over for a brief meeting. Tell me what's going on. If I can help you, I'll help you. If I can't, I can't. But to hear the language that I just used, which is different from most people, go back to mental architecture. Most people beg their way into a sale. Here's what a lot of salespeople say. You know, Mr. Jones, I'm going to be in your neighborhood. I only need five minutes. Right? Well, that sure sounds like begging their way into a, a conversation with me. So not surprisingly, when you do meet with Mr. Jones, he's not looking at you as a valued guest. He's looking at you as an interloper. You forced your way in for five minutes, and I will guarantee he'll be looking at his watch every minute of the five. But if you invite me to your home, how are you going to treat me? Like a guest. Like a guest, absolutely. So I often say, why don't you invite me in for a brief meeting? All right, we'll talk about what the problems are. And if I can help you, I will. And if I can't, I can't. That's it. Because if you invite me in, you're going to treat me like a guest. And I've had people say, and I'm kidding, I'll give you the one greatest example how powerful this is. I had a person that wanted to meet with me at 7 o'clock at night. And I said, listen, I'll make a deal with you. Uh, but you know, if you come over, because I would have had a long day, uh, you know, have a hot cup of coffee there. And I like those little, uh, those little pound cakes in the metal thing there in the freezer. Right? Now, I said that completely kiddingly. Right? What do you think was there when I got there? Exactly. Which, by the way, with whipped cream and strawberries, and it was fabulous. Right? Because if you, if you tell them, if they see you as helping them, they're going to want you around if you make them feel better. If you make people realize that it's not as bleak and it's not as terrible, the sky's not falling, right? Yes, are there problems in the world? Absolutely. Are they overcomable? Absolutely, because in every difficult situation, there is some subsection of the market that thrives. I'll give you the greatest example of that. We call positive deviance. So if you're writing these nuts, write this down, positive deviance. And there's a, great, there's a great example that goes along with that, okay? but you've got to give me some autonomy, and I want to make sure we keep staying on time. Uh, there is an island off the coast of Madagascar. Right? So everybody knows their geography, knows where Madagascar is, right? Island off the coast of Madagascar. And on this particular island, there is all of these tribes, or there, there was all these tribes of monkeys. And the interesting thing about that is they had a fungus that came through and wiped out most of the vegetation on this island. Now, because these particular kinds of monkeys were primarily vegetarian, an enormous section of the monkeys uh, perished. But there was one tribe of the monkeys that started to eat crabs. They started to eat seafood. They were able to eat fish and things that they were readily able to find on the shore. And, and that particular tribe of monkeys thrived. Now, you're 50 years later to present time. Now, what do you think all the monkeys on that island eat? along with vegetation. Crabs. Seafood, exactly. Crabs and fish and all the things they could find. It's called a positive deviant. What it means is that there will always be a subsection of the market that, despite the circumstances, will thrive. And, and their thriving will then dominate everybody else. Microsoft is a good example of positive deviant. At the particular time when they were really, really struggling technologically, Microsoft comes in 
And now their operating system, if it's not an Apple, is on every computer on the face of the earth, right? Microsoft is probably the number one dominant operating system next to Apple's system, which is proprietary on Apple. On the earth, every country, every manufacturer uses that same system. Positive deviance. So regardless, I, want, I don't want to paint a bleak picture. For the person that's over here, right, they're looking for a rope and they're looking for a, 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 you know, a, a branch to throw it over, right? Things are not, but you, if you're prepared for it, and you work hard, and you realize that it is an effort. It is hard. None of these things are easy. Is it doable? Absolutely. Is it doable to the point where you'll be incredibly successful? Absolutely. But you know what most people fear? Because we were talking about risk. Rejection. Rejection. They'll feel bad about themselves. right? If I talk to Mr. Jones and I say, Mr. Jones, should we write it up? And Mr. Jones says, no. I'm going to feel bad about myself. Because I develop my self-worth from my role, not my identity. They fear rejection. They fear anything that's going to be risky. They fear anything because they have this mental architecture of scarcity. So they fear the risk. They fear rejection. You know what they also fear? Success. They also fear success. Why? Because you know what to do. Everybody knows what to do. I could sit somebody down and say, one of the first things when I'm, when I'm hired by a company to work with their sales force, here's the things I ask them. What are the three things that you need to do, would be able to do right now that would have an immediate effect on improving your sales? And you know the interesting thing about it? Without fail in question, they write down the three things. They, I will say, what are the three things you need to do right now today to immediately increase your sales? And they will write them down. And I, you know what I will say? Do those, give me my check. Because they know what they need to do. Most people realize what they need to do to be successful. And yet, they fear rejection. Why? These people aren't rejecting you if they don't want to buy your widget, right? They don't care about that, right? You know, I, I give you a great, although somewhat seedy, example of my heavy metal youth and my brother Dennis, who occasionally looks at this and watches these things. My brother Dennis, when we were at a heavy metal band, this is back in the mid, you know, this is back in the early 80s, right? Leather pants, right? Big hair, right? Ah, the good old days. My brother used to hit on every girl at the bar. Now, I don't mean like, like a few of the girls. I mean every single girl at the bar. Didn't matter how young you were, how old you were, had no idea, made no difference. He hit on every single girl at the bar. We used to, he would have a t-shirt with the sleeves cut off, white t-shirt. Across it, he would spray paint available. <laughs> he got slapped a lot. Fill in the rest of the blank, OK? Because the idea was is that, is that you don't fear rejection. If you, if you ask somebody to buy 10 times in a row and nine say no, well, that's OK. We all have whatever our odds are, but most people, because they fear rejection, are never going to ask. They're not going to go to the networking. I don't like talking to people. I don't know what to say. I, I don't want to do an event. I don't want to do a webinar. I don't want to do a conference call. I don't want to be a speaker. I, I don't want to do social media. Um, you know, I, I don't like to knock on doors. I don't like to make cold calls. What if they don't want to talk to me? Because that little voice in the back of their mind, what is that little voice saying? right? You know, children should be what if, seen and not heard, right? Hey, this person is busy. Why are you calling and wasting their time? Because that's a little thing in the back. What if you had the cure for cancer? I mean, legitimately had the cure for cancer. Don't you think you'd be on the corner like, listen, I got the cure for cancer for real. The real cure for cancer. Of course you would. People fear rejection. They fear success. They fear doing the critical things they know that they desperately need to do. <laughs> in order to be doing it. And because we have, you OK? OK. All right. Well, that's OK. I haven't, I haven't lost an attendee yet. You're not going to be my first one. No. OK. All right. So we look at all the personality types of people that are out there. And the interesting thing about all the different types of personality is they all buy. They may buy differently, right? There might be a different circumstances by which they buy. But there's a drinking fountain right around the corner if you want to grab a drink. Good. I'd offer you some of my coffee, but it's, it's like ridiculously powerful. All right. So the personalities all change. The people that are out there, and they come from every aspect of the world. 
It's our goal, excuse me, as salespeople, to be able to deal with all of these varying personalities. You have some people that are very outgoing, right? So I tend to be very outgoing. I'm very gregarious. I'm Italian. If you tie my hands, I can't talk. But if I'm with a quiet person, that librarian type, I'm going to dial down the candle power of Don. Why? Because she gets initially, or he, gets initially whatever personality they need. Right? But if I'm with Robin Williams, you know, when he was still alive in a room, we'd both be bouncing off the ceiling. Why? Because the goal is to be as much like the people that you're doing business with. Again, this is a function of your mental architecture. Sales is hard. You're frequently alone. You're frequently talking to people that don't want to talk to you. Uh, even, even, you know what they want? Even if it was half as much as you were selling it for, what they really want is for you to give them to it for free, and they want you to pay them for it. They want it for free, and they want money on top. Now, we know that's obviously not going to happen. But because of what it is, it does take a certain type of person to be successful in sales. Does that mean you're born as a salesman? No, I don't believe that. I do not believe that. What I do believe is if you surround yourself by the people that espouse and aspire to and actually, from a behavioral point of view, do the types of activities necessary to be successful in sales, you'll be successful also. We often say this, you can't control who buys, right? You can't arm wrestle somebody to the ground and say sign on the dotted line. But you can control the behaviors that create a buying environment. What would that be? Well, prospecting is a behavior. Taking your existing clients out to lunch or over coffee, that's a behavior. Making social media posts, that's a behavior. Right? Getting testimonials, that's a behavior. Those are all things we can completely and absolutely control. And depending on the personality that you have, dictates what you do. So the entire session, we've been talking about the idea of mental architecture. What makes us think the way that we do? Because so much of what we do in the world is not the reality of the circumstance, it's the reality of how we interpret the circumstance. Let me give you another example. I like to use examples because I think it really makes sense. So say, for example, you are having, you know, you're financially you're devastated, right? You owe everybody, you're behind on your car, your rent, you know, you're going to be in the street, homeless, blah, 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 bad as it could possibly be. So you pick whatever bad as it could possibly be is for you, right? And in desperation, you go out and you buy a lottery ticket. You take your last dollar and you buy a lottery ticket. And you win. And that moment that you win, you still don't have the money, right? If it's a multi-million dollar lottery, it could take six months for you to get that because they have to make sure it's your ticket. They have to go back and look at the video, verify that you bought it at the place. The ticket's not tampered with. They're just not going to randomly give you millions of dollars because you produce something that you say is the right ticket. No, it doesn't work like that. There's a whole investigative process. So it could take six months for you to get that actual money. But how do you feel that moment that you found out you won? Now, keep in mind, you still have all your bills. You're still going to be homeless tomorrow. They're still going to repossess your car. Everything is still the same. You don't have the money. You don't necessarily know exactly when you're going to get it. But how do you feel? How do you feel? Absolutely, sure. You know that at some point in time, assuming you know the ticket's legit, so if you in your heart know that you bought it properly and honestly, and that when they do all their investigations, there's, there's no shenanigans, you know you're going to get that money at some time. You don't have it now, but at some time in the future. You still have all your problems. Your car's still getting repoed tomorrow. They're still throwing you out tomorrow. You have all of your issues, but how do you feel? Even though nothing actually concrete has been done to change your circumstances. You still feel bulletproof, right? None of these things bother you, right? So fine, if I'm homeless, I'm going to be homeless for a couple months and I'll be in a mansion, right? Fine, take my piece of shit, take my crappy car, right? You know, I'm going to go buy, you know, a, a new Lamborghini. Because at that moment, you feel, it's not the reality of the circumstance, you feel you're a lottery winner. You feel rich. You feel like a multimillionaire. Again, it hasn't happened. And that just shows you the power of the mental architecture in sales. How do you go past the reality of your circumstance and tap into the possibility of your circumstance? 
That's all the difference between being successful and being non-successful. Does it take a risk? Absolutely. Sure, salespeople routinely constantly live on the edge. You're rich, you're poor, you're rich, you're poor, you're rich, you're poor, you're rich, you're poor. Right? Make a big sale, you're rich. Lose a big sale, you feel like jumping off the top of the building. All of these things play very, very strongly, in, again, into the mental architecture of what you do. But if you do it and you're aware of it, it's very easy to get around it. Let's talk, the last thing I want to talk about is mental tapes. And we referred to it earlier in the session. And I put it at the end because that really is what triggers all of this. You are who you surround yourself with. Interestingly enough, the psychologist came out and said, you are the average of the five people closest to you. Five people close to you are the average. And by the way, that's a husband, a wife, brother, sister, children, business associates, neighbors, friends. You're the average of those people. Because those people may not necessarily have the means or capacity to help you get higher or lower, they, may have, they really may have only the means and capacity to keep you at about the same level as you are right now. So I believe the solution to move from a scarcity mindset, which is riddled with risk and fear, into a more abundance mindset that moves you into a less procrastinative mindset, which engages the part of your brain at action, right? not, not at thought, at action. There's a section of your brain that is engaged for action. I was a volunteer fireman for 15 years, right? The, the first thing that they would teach you is if you stand still, you die. That was the one thing that I remember in the fire service because your situation is dynamic. It's always moving. Where you are right now, where you think is safe, could be the most dangerous place to be in a second. You can't stay there. That's why, if you remember the, the old race car things, if you're a race car driver and you ever saw a spin out that was covered in smoke, you always go towards where the car was. Why? Because there's a good chance that that moved from where it was to someplace else, right? It's, the car is not going to stay there when it's going 200 miles an hour out of control. There's a very good chance it's going to be someplace different than when you caught it last. So that abundance, that abundance of mindset moves away from scarcity, moves away from procrastination, gives you that OK feeling, which is OK for you, but it's also OK for them. If I can help you, I will. If I can't help you, I won't. But I will tell you that. Why? Because I can't help everybody. And I say that all the time. I may not be able to help you. I don't know. Again, we go back to that methodology. I'm a problem solver looking for problems to solve. If you don't have a problem, there's nothing for me to solve. There's a good chance I'm not going to make that sale. There's, if we go to that abundance philosophy and we understand that these people are rejecting whatever that circumstance or that transaction is, maybe the product that you're selling, the service that you're selling, that doesn't mean they don't like you as a person. They might think you're a wonderful person, and yet for whatever reason, that rejection is not on you. Yet most people take it to heart. They say, well, if you don't want to buy my widget, therefore, I extrapolate that to mean you don't like me. Well, that's not the case at all. I have many people that I don't buy from that are my best friends. Doesn't mean I haven't tried to buy from them, but based on circumstances and whatever they had, it didn't make any sense. Doesn't mean I don't like them. It just means that the circumstances, but some people are so afraid of rejection on every matter, right? They're, they're afraid to ask for the sale. Right, you go back to sales 101, you have to ask for the sale. Don't assume somebody's going to say, yes, I want to buy it. It's OK to say, Mr. Jones, have you heard enough to make a decision whether or not this is a good fit for you? They'd never say that. Those words could never come out of their lips. You go down, they're afraid of success. I think most people know what they need to do in order to be healthy, in order to be happy, in order to be successful, in order to be jubilant, whether it's spiritual, whatever it is, they know what they need to do. Most people don't need to be told. And yet, for whatever reason, they don't do it. And the only thing that I can attribute that to is, is a fear of doing it. Maybe they're, somehow or another, if they make a lot of money, their friends aren't going to like them, they're, you know, they're going to move into a bigger house and they're not going to be with their neighbors, who knows? Right? We, all, we all have our own demons to deal with. And then ultimately, at the end, we have the personalities. Everybody's different. You know, you, you have the introverts, you have the extroverts. You, you look at all the personalities across all of the spectrums. And we as salespeople have to coincide and interact and coordinate with all these different personalities. 
Well, that needs to be a very mindful effort. It's not that you bring the same face to everybody at the same time. And then the most damning of all is this mental tapes. It's all the things that we hear, right? It, when you pick up the phone, you don't remember the 10 great, super successful cold calls you made. You remember the one time the guy says, not interested, and hangs up. All right, I was working with a University of Michigan linebacker one time. It's a great, great story because my, my practice, my, my staff and everybody who works is back in Michigan. I'm working with this University of Michigan ex-linebacker. Again, guy's 300 pounds. He's two dons. And, and he was working with a company, and part of what they needed to do was make just cold calls, prospecting calls. Here was this, again, mountain of a man. His hand is shaking, literally shaking as he's going to pick up the phone. Literally shaking. And, and, and I said, I said, well, you know, when you, were, when you were back on the U of M football team, I said, when, when you would line up, all right, and here's guys as big as you, if not bigger, facing you. What, what did they want to do to you? And they said their goal was to put me out of the game. That was it. Their goal was to put you out, not, not just stop you. Their goal was to put you out of the game. They, they don't want you to come to the field again. Now, they're not going to do it, not going to do it in a penalty situation, but if they hit you legally hard enough where you don't come back in the game, that's a positive check mark in their world. I'm like, wow. I go, did you ever get hurt? He said, all the time. I said, you ever have broke a bone? Oh, yeah. You ever play, play with that broken bone? Oh, yeah. Did you ever get bloody? Oh, yeah. Right? Bruised, beaten, sweaty? Oh, all the time, every game. And I said, and you won't pick up that phone. And the person on the other end of the phone can do nothing to hurt you. Right? Even if they say not interested and hang up. His fear was not the fear of anything. He would gladly get hit and beat up and broken and bloodied and broke bones and hurt himself. It was that fear of rejection. They're not going to like me. They're not going to want to talk to me. They're going to say, I am a terrible person. They're going to say, I'm a terrible representative of my company. None of those things are true. None of those things are true. Because I would pick up the phone and call the same person that just said no to you. I can't guarantee they're going to say yes to me. But I would be totally OK talking to them. Why? What's the worst that could happen? I call it a zero-sum game, right? When I picked up the phone, what did I have at that point? Nothing. If, I, if that phone call goes nowhere, I get nothing from it, what do I have at that point? Amen. Same thing, exactly. I have nothing. I haven't been diminished any. I'm not less now. Maybe I lost 30 <laughs> seconds of time off my life, but I'm not diminished in any way. So much of sales is mental. So much of being in business is mental. So much of being in athletics is mental. So much of being successful is mental. If you are the kind of person that will not stop, I am relentless. I will not stop, period. It doesn't make any difference what it is. Everything is a speed bump. Anything is a roadblock. doesn't make any difference. I will not stop. That's why understanding the mental architecture is such a critical aspect in, in all of sales. So let's go around the room. We always start ladies first. Stephanie, what did you get from today's session? Well, the thing that I liked was you sell like you feel. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So that was a very good illustration there. Mm -hmm. Sure. If you feel empowered, if you feel energized, if you feel like you've got the cure for cancer, you're going to have no problem yelling that from the yard arms. It's the people that don't feel like they have that. So that's a great takeaway. Randy, what'd you get? Well, I have a, uh, a presentation that I do at dinner with, at restaurants. Right. And we invite people in. I don't sell anything. I sell the idea of having a salesman come into their home. I love that. I talk about the products. I talk sure. about pricing. I'm going to switch something. Absolutely. Instead of, we'd like to schedule a time. No. I will, I'm going to start asking people to invite us to have him come yeah. into their home. And I say, and a brief, so here's what you want to say. So, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, if, if you think this is making sense, invite us in for a brief conversation. We think we can help, but if we can't. No, no. If you think we can help. Right. So, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, if you heard some things and seen some things in today's presentation you think resonated with you, invite us in for a brief meeting. If it makes sense, great. Welcome aboard. If it doesn't, we're going to say thank you very much. Goodbye. That's it. There's no pressure. We don't sell every, you know, we don't, every time we go out to somebody's house, we don't pressure them. If it makes sense, great. If it doesn't make sense, then don't do it. 
But that idea of, again, the language is critical. Why don't you invite me in for a brief meeting? Because if I invite you to my home, I treat you like a guest, right? If I beg my way into a, a, an appointment, that's how, I'm, that's how I'm kind of thought of, is that interloper, that intruder, not a valued guest who's coming in. So when I go, when people invite me in, they couldn't, they couldn't be nicer to me. I mean, they, they go out of their way. Why? Because I'm like, okay, well, I'll try to help you. I don't know if I can. You've got the problem, not me. And that's the way they see it, because that's the way we make sure they see it. Cody, what'd you get? Procrastination is a measure of quality perfection. The mental architecture of perfection. You believe that if it's not perfect, doesn't make any sense to do it. Right? And I've had, I've had somebody say one time, they said, I don't do conference calls because I don't have a good voice. <laughs> I don't have a good voice. I said, well, do you have anybody you work with that has a good voice? And he goes, oh, yeah, I, I partner with this lady. She sounds great. I'm like, OK, problem solved. Now, now what's your excuse going to be now? Right? Because again, all these things are excuses. Right? It, it's like we find a reason, and in our mind, the reason is a good reason. Well, I sound terrible. Right? Well, I've done thousands of conference, well, maybe not thousands, hundreds of conference calls, but close to a thousand. I've never had anybody I've ever been on a conference call with that didn't sound good. Maybe you sound like Daffy Duck or something, maybe there might be an issue. But in his mind, he didn't have a good voice, therefore he couldn't do it. Well, so, so I'm so smart, you couldn't figure out to do it with somebody else that you thought had a better voice? So you're right, you'll give, and it'll sound like a good reason. And that's a mistake a lot of people make. They get into the trap that if it can't be perfect, I'm not going to do it, right? If I don't have, you know, you know, I'd love to go to Montana, but if I don't have three weeks, I can't go, right? But I can get a week, right? But in their mind, if I can't get three weeks, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's 4 o'clock. You know, it's, it's way too late to make prospecting calls. Uh, you know, it's, uh, the, the networking event started 10 minutes ago. It's too late to go. No, it's not. None of these things are true. But again, that in their, in, what's that? That happened to us today, because I told Randy, I said, Randy was on a business call. And I said, oh, no, we're going to be late. We're going to be late. But this was the best one for me today. Well, thank so you. I'm so glad I came. And I'm very glad that you came. Did you miss? All right, so the idea ultimately is, again, it's easy to have a lot of reasons why not to, right? You hear it all the time, right? I hear people all the time. You know, I'll talk to somebody, and they were going to go to a networking event the evening before. And we agreed that I would call them the next day. And I, and I said, I, so how did it go? Oh, I ended up not going. And I'd say, why not? And I said, oh, it, it, it's because you had your family over and you had a whole evening of love and, and you know, camaraderie and you know, great, you know, great emotions and you, you know, got to see people that you love. Here's what they say. Nah, I just stayed home. Yeah, but you made yourself a fabulous dinner with like, great food and everything like that. Right? No, had leftovers. Yeah, but you had friends over and you had some drinks and you really laughed and it was really good. You really went to bed like fulfilled. No, I just sat there and watched TV. When you autopsy it, it sounds really pathetic. And I'm like, well, I didn't. I went to that event. It was great. I had drinks. I had fun. I laughed. I went. I hung out. I got two new prospects. Why? Because I'm right here. I'm right here. I think every time I walk in a room, people are going to throw themselves at me. I really do. Now, not everybody feels like that. But I will tell you, if you surround yourself enough with people like that, you will start to think like that too. I, just, I, call it, you know, I call it the band theory. You get the one front man in the band, like the David Lee Ross or the Van Halens, keeping in mind that most of the guys in that particular band were all introverts. You get one person who's that extrovert, they all become that extrovert following him. Who knows why? Why? Because your mental architecture is pliable. It, it changes, it morphs. It, it looks at what your surroundings are, and then it manifests itself most appropriately for that. Stephen. Is uh, the concept of extending different, uh, extending invitations to different personality types. Oh, always. Because everybody's different. There's everybody out, and they all have their different motivations. It's really interesting because once you understand motivations, 
it's much easier to address the motivation. Some people, it's a fear motivation. We talked about it last session. People are motivated by a variety of different things. But the interesting thing about sales, whether you're the client or you're the salesperson, is, is really a mental game. It, it's really this, 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 this mental effort more so than, than anything else. It's an understanding of who and what you are and, and an attempt to try to be as close to who and what they are and figure out a way to kind of meet in the middle. Sales is hard, right? Again, you're frequently alone, you're frequently talking to someone, it, and it doesn't, you're not born a salesperson, but you have to be cogent that you need to think like a salesperson. So thank you so much. I appreciate everyone who's joined us. It's an absolute privilege to come and do this week after week to you. Um, you know, always reach out to us if there's anything going on you need some help with, uh, and I wish you good selling. Bye-bye, everybody. I'm glad you clap, yeah. <laughs>